Okay, so hopefully um, we're all in the right place. Um, as, as Mark has totally embarrassed me and said, uh, my name is Paul Andrew, I, I'm not going to introduce myself any further. We are here this evening to talk about Data Factory, and what I want to do for you guys is give you an introduction to it, and particularly talk about the control flow elements within the service, and also now the data flow elements that are coming soon. So um, just a quick one, if you do want the slides from my presentation, feel free to go and get them from my GitHub repo. There's a, a community events um, repository in there that's got subfolders for, for various events, locations and things, um, I'm sure you'll figure it out. There's a, a PDF of that slide deck or this slide deck already in there. So a bit of background. And, and what I've done is uh, I've learned to um, put some HTML rant tags on when we're, we're giving background. That, that makes me seem less grumpy, apparently. So it's your data factory. And, and the reason for the background here is because of this simple statement. Azure Data Factory is SQL Server integration services in the cloud. Now, this is a rant. That statement I don't really agree with. And, and certainly when Azure Data Factory came along in sort of early 2016, that statement was most definitely incorrect. But nevertheless, this was how we were told about it. This was how it was marketed. So from those sort of early days of version one, when we were very much sort of hand cranking our own JSON files and trying to get them deployed and things into Azure, we've now sort of come a lot further along with version two of the service um, up to sort of present day. And I guess what we could perhaps now reflect on and, and with this statement, and if we said data factory is SQL Server integration services in the cloud, I, I still disagree with the statement, but it's certainly getting there. The capabilities that it now offers and what we can do with it does mean that it's, you know, it's, it's almost comparable. So a bit of background and obviously uh, rant over, but I think hopefully that will kind of inform the, my choice of title here for this session and hopefully sets the scene a little bit. So what I want to talk about within this session then, just a, a, a loose agenda, we're going to start off with Data Factory, so as, as an introduction, very, very uh, light, looking at its components, looking at the concepts and why we want to use it. Then going a, a little bit deeper as to how we might need to extend Data Factory. We, we ultimately don't live in a perfect world of data, so sometimes we do have to do things a little more customized to work with that. Looking at some sort of production considerations with cost and, and continuous integration, and, and then I guess maybe the, the, the exciting feature and probably the thing that um, possibly most people are on here for is to look at the data flows component. And just to kind of break down that agenda from my title, first few bits will kind of look at a control flow sort of element of Data Factory and then data flows at the end. So first up then, if we ask the question, what is Azure Data Factory? It is not integration services in the cloud, but you know it does go some way to helping us achieve the same sort of things. And this is what Microsoft gives on their website. This is what we're now told about it. It's a hybrid data integration at scale made easy. And you know, we've got a, a few elements in there as to give us a clue as to what it's going to do for us. And although all of those things are, are true, which is um, which is quite nice. The the key thing and um, the, the main sort of takeaway here, if you can see that laser pointer, is orchestrate. Data Factory is an orchestrator. And I say hopefully this will kind of become clear as we go through. So that's the Microsoft version of what Data Factory is. I prefer my version. So what we have here is a few components, and we've got Data Factory in there. And if we want to get from sort of A to B, we can do a copy and we can do a transform. And Data Factory will facilitate that copy and it will facilitate that transform. And it will take instructions in the form of JSON. So it will orchestrate those operations as it goes through using the JSON instructions that we give it. Now, to sort of emphasize that and to ask that question in a different way, if I said to you, what does Data Factory do? The simple answer there is that it actually doesn't really do anything. It doesn't do any of the heavy lifting itself. It simply passes off the instructions to another service and it's that service that then is going to do the work. 
So Data Factory, say, is the orchestrator of those other services that it invokes to do the work for it. So, you know, that's very true of, of lots of these sort of flows of data. So if we kind of get into Data Factory then and look at what it's made of, and um, clearly I've not animated everything as uh, correctly as I should have, but the components within Data Factory that we actually need to achieve this orchestration. The first one of those is linked services. So it's the information about how do we connect to whatever it is we want to work with. And in the case of a SQL database, you know, the linked service that we create, it's going to contain the connection string information, username, password, database, the, the, the normal stuff. And again, you know, we, if we want to start making those comparisons, we could say that this linked service is very much like our SSIS connection manager. Again, fair comparison. Data Factory, um, when I was looking at this the other day, it's, um, it now boasts 88 linked services to, to various things, uh, all supported as first-class systems, so good to know. Play the icon game on there. Um, there is an access database icon on there, which uh, I think we should all avoid, but it's good to know that we can create a linked service to it if we want. So that's it, the first component, linked services. The second thing we need to consider within Data Factory is this notion of a data set. Now, this isn't the actual data that we're going to work with. It's where that data is going to be and, and what format. So if we think about our SQL table, it's going to be what is that table schema, what is that table's name. If we're talking to something like Data Lake Storage, it's going to be the file path that we need to talk to and the, maybe the data set, its extension, you know, we can include things here as well in the data set about the schema. It's that metadata information that Data Factory needs driven from those linked services to understand what it's going to do. Third component, activities. So the activities are the instructions for the service that we want to invoke. Very bespoke information. So if we're going to have an activity to call a Databricks notebook, we need to give tailored information in our JSON for that activity so it, Data Factory knows what it's asking of that service that it invokes. Moving swiftly on, our fourth component that we need to consider is this idea of a pipeline. And a pipeline, quite simply, is just a logical grouping of things within our data factory. Now, you know, the terminology sort of crosses over and, and things bleed into each other a little bit. And it's often said that our data pipeline as the sort of the grand solution of things that we're doing here, which we you know is fine in that context, but also just be aware that a pipeline is actually a component of data factory. And again, if we want to make some SSIS comparisons here, that's fine. We could, if you like, think of a pipeline as a sequence container. Probably better to think of a pipeline actually as a package. And the reason for that is that within a data factory, we can have an execute pipeline activity. So this kind of gives us that notion of parent-child pipelines within our data factory service, one parent pipeline calling another child pipeline. In a very similar way, we might, you know, chain our SSIS packages. So again, another loose comparison there. It's also worth noting that within a pipeline, you know, we can have multiple activities, multiple things happening here, and it just gives us, as I say, that, that control of those group of things that we want to happen. We do have to have a pipeline. That pipeline, you know, it does need to contain some activities those activities are going to have an input and an output data set potentially, and those data sets are going to get their credential information from a linked service. So you can kind of understand the sort of logical order of these components that we've, we need to work with and we need to create. The fifth thing that we then might need, we don't necessarily have to, but we need something to execute our pipelines, and these are called triggers. So what we do is in Data Factory, we create a trigger and we attach that trigger to a pipeline or many pipelines. It doesn't have to be one, it could be many. And those triggers now, um, as you can see from this list here, they can be manual and, and tumbling windows and things. So 
an um, obvious case, the, the manual triggers, we are very much reliant on a user to go in there or, you know, a developer and, and click trigger now, you know, and that will go and execute that pipeline, which is fine. Or maybe, you know, we can use a little bit of PowerShell, if you like. I, I consider that a manual approach, but, you know, we could, of course, then automate that in some other way, if you like, but it's good to know that the option's there. Next type of trigger is something that's called a tumbling window. Now, this was renamed in version two. It used to be called time slices. And this was this sort of notion, this idea that for all of your data sets and your activities, you would define this sort of timeline. And then you would say for a given you know, frequency of months, let's say, and, and an interval of uh, you know, one or two, it would carve up that timeline into these time slices. And then that one time slice would become one execution of the activities. It's kind of a, worked quite well in, in version one if you're using time series data quite a lot. In version two, perhaps it's not the trigger of choice for me, but you know, it does still have um, some use cases. And the fact that it's now been renamed to tumbling windows, uh, I don't mind that so much because it's a similar idea to tumbling windows that we have in Azure Stream Analytics. So bear in mind. We, of course, have scheduled triggers, which is probably the, the more familiar one that we might use. And, you know, if we want to make another comparison here to our SQL Server agents, then perhaps we could do. We can have triggers that, that are scheduled. Um, the lowest granularity is one minute, and, and they do operate on UTC. So we can have that very recursive type thing happening based on what we've defined. Blob file events is our next trigger. This, at the moment, only supports Azure Blob Storage, and we do only have file create and file deleted events, but, you know, obviously if we are creating a, an event-driven load process, it's quite nice to, to have that capability there. You might, you know, sort of loosely think of this as the sort of um, simplified version of what you'd get from an Azure event grid. Similar idea, but I say simplified and, and wrapped up as a data factory trigger. And then the last one on the list here is Logic Apps. So if we've got, you know, some, some wrapper maybe for our data factory, we've got some wider process going on in a Logic App, it's good to know that we can sort of crack, cancel, create, and invoke our data factory pipelines from Logic Apps as well if we want. It's a little bit of a, a chicken or an egg situation because parts of data factory actually under the hood are built on logic apps so you know you kind of using logic apps to trigger logic apps or, or vice versa you know so a bit of an odd one but um, it's, it's good that we've got that capability and that interaction between those Azure services so just to recap those five components are link services data sets activities pipelines and triggers so these are all things that we're going to need if we're going to build our data factory sort of control flow elements now, what's quite nice is that in version two, all of that JSON that we're going to put into there, whether it be via the UI or we're going to develop it in some other way, those first four components now, that JSON can be dynamic. So we can actually inject parameters into it and create variables and, you know, we can um, I've written a blog post on it, potentially have a single link service that's used for multiple SQL Server databases, you know, if we want to pass that in at runtime. And so it gives us that sort of injection into the JSON. And, you know, we could potentially think of this as uh, the same way that we might create our ARM templates if we're doing, you know, wider things within our Azure environment. The ARM templates and the JSON and the syntax, it's very similar to how Data Factory expects those parameters and variables to be presented. A um, little bit of self-promotion. If you're coming to SQL Bits, I'm doing a, a talk there on more complex orchestration with dynamic pipelines, which is very much a, a deep dive hour on achieving just that and, and creating some very you know, complex metadata-driven pipelines. So, there is uh, scope to go deeper there, but obviously we, we won't for now. Just be, just be mindful of it. So five components done. Next thing we need to understand and talk about within our data factory is this idea of an integration runtime. So this is, in some cases, the compute that we need for data factory to do its work, to, you know, ask another service to do something. And these integration runtimes come in three different flavors. 
First one is originally named the Azure Integration Runtime. And this is the thing that we actually get out of the box by default with a data factory service when we deploy it. It will have one Azure integration runtime, and that will auto-resolve to a particular Azure region, depending on where your data set is at source and destination. It will look at that and dynamically adjust where it thinks is best for it to pull or push that data from. We can have multiple integration runtimes. We can set it to a particular Azure region if you want. And I guess the, the thing to note here is that if Data Factory as the orchestration service isn't supported for you in a particular Azure region, it's probably worth noting that the integration runtime probably will be. So you know, if your data can't leave a particular area, orchestrate it from a region where Data Factory is available but make sure the integration runtime is only within the region that you're using. So then you'll know your data isn't going to leave there. So that's the first one to bear in mind. Next integration runtime is what we need for our SSIS packages. And, and when I am going to talk a bit more about the, the SSIS integration runtime later on. Worth just noting that it is specific to an Azure region. There's no sort of flexibility or, or auto uh, movement there. We'll come back to that one in a bit. And then lastly, the self-hosted integration runtime. This is something that was previously called the uh, data management gateway, but uh, you know, then we kind of got confused between a Power BI gateway and a data factory gateway, and, and yeah, they aren't the same thing. So we've renamed this one to the, the self-hosted integration runtime. It is still a gateway of sorts, and it sits on a virtual machine, a Windows box that you install as a client. So just talking a little more about it and kind of understanding that integration runtime in particularly, because it's kind of important if we're thinking about our, our wider design of our Azure solution. That self-hosted integration runtime, say installed on a, a Windows virtual machine, it's going to give us the capability to get from our on-premises resources up into Azure. So it acts a bit like a, a VPN gateway, if you like. So if we've got a SQL server locally, the integration runtime is going to talk to that SQL server, and it will allow that um, channel through up to Azure through our, our data factory. And we can you know, register an integration runtime with one data factory or many, and vice versa, we can have many integration runtimes to one data factory. And this gives us kind of a, a load balance and, and failover type situation if we've got lots of copy activities going down to our local resources. So that kind of, that's in a situation where that integration runtime is working on premises. Maybe it's on our local infrastructure. What we might also want to consider, which um, is becoming, um, I think, more and more popular with my customers, is they have Express Route implemented. And that's obviously going to give them a, a lot more bandwidth, a lot more security with that sort of private connection. So in that scenario, we just want to kind of move that border of where our integration runtime is going to sit. So in this situation, you'll see that that IR is potentially going to live on a virtual machine that also sits in Azure. And the reason for that is that then when we've got Express Route deployed, that virtual machine is going to talk to its, uh, through its VNet, it's going to have the express route connection, and then we can get down on premises. So say so that's more of a, a common scenario that, that um, a lot of customers that can afford express route ultimately are starting to, to go with, I think. So just bear that one in mind. So that's my sort of components within Data Factory sort of rounded off with uh, those five things. And then we talked about those integration runtimes. I guess now just to sort of complete this first part of my talk, I, I kind of pose the question of, well, why use Data Factory? You know, I've, I've said that it can do some of these things and it's going to orchestrate stuff for us and it allows us to maybe get to our on-prem resources. But still the, the, the question there is, is why? And the best way I think to, to answer that is to talk about um, this, this fairly daunting and, and pretty picture, which we would now describe as the modern data warehouse. 
So all of these components, all of these moving parts on this you know, platform as a service tech that we've now got available in Azure, you can see that um, at the sort of bottom layer there for our management and, and for the orchestration of all of this stuff, Data Factory is kind of the service we need to act as the sort of the management umbrella for all of that. All of those transformations and the data ingestion, we need Data Factory to, to do that stuff for us. And, you know, coming back to my first statement of Data Factory is SSIS in the cloud, well, it is in some senses, but it's also they there perhaps maybe as our SQL Server agent in the cloud as well when we think about triggering things. So it's kind of both, and I say it's that umbrella for, for all of this good stuff that we might now create. So moving on, let's think now about extending our data factory. And I say uh, we know we don't live in a perfect world of data. There's always going to be some scenario where the the out of the box tools just don't cater for what we need. And you know, I dare say the the 88 link services that um, that we showed. You know, somebody's always going to have a an 89 or something that isn't supported there. Uh, I had a customer that needed to connect to a, an inter-systems cache database the other day, and so well, how do we do that? And you know, we ended up using ODBC drivers, but um, so there's always another scenario. So I guess for that, uh, I just wanted to, to talk to, to that extensibility a little bit. The first thing that we can do in our data factory to extend it is to use something that's called a custom activity. Now, a custom activity, as, as it suggests here, it's a, a .NET console app that's executed with the Azure batch service. Now, I, I feel that for completeness, I need to just kind of share with you what the Azure batch service is, because it, it kind of sits there, and I think some people, um, they, you know, they never really touch it or, or understand what it's for. So just um, very quickly, as a bit of a digression, the, the Azure batch service is this pool of compute that we define. And it is a, a platform as a service offering, but with infrastructure beneath it. So we define this compute pool as a set of virtual machines. And then one compute node within the pool is one virtual machine that is going to be deployed. And this service is quite nice because it will auto scale out as if we you know if we want more virtual machines, if we throw more tasks at our Azure batch service, it's going to scale out to handle that for us. And we can RDP to these VM compute nodes um, if we want to, to look at debugging and things. So I say a bit of a digression, but it's worth just having a, a, a loose understanding of that Azure batch service if we want to use an Azure Data Factory custom activity. So back to the main point, a custom activity. This .NET console app, well, what do we actually need here if we're going to have some custom .NET code execute using Data Factory? Well, first thing we might need to do is, is break out the, our old friend Visual Studio. And in my case, I would probably write some C Sharp classes to do some work. And I'd compile that into an application, a, an executable console application. I'd then put that up into Azure Blob Storage because it, it needs to live somewhere in its kind of compiled form. I'd then, of course, deploy our Data Factory service, and I am going to need the Azure batch service to run the console app for me. And of course, that's got its compute pool of virtual machines. Then over on the right-hand side, I've potentially got some storage that's got my actual data in it, my actual records that need cleaning. And the sort of common scenario that I come across here is a, a CSV file that has got some text qualifiers in it. It's got a free text field and some nice person has decided to put carriage returns in that source data. And, you know, it's kind of broken the structure of the CSV file. So we're going to need some custom code just to handle that, just to prepare and clean that data. So we're going to have that console app to do that. We have written it, and then we have our pipelines within Data Factory. We have our custom activity that sits there uh, alongside the, the other activities. And then what happens is at runtime, Data Factory goes and says to the batch service, hey, have a task. This is what you need to do. 
the batch service will go and get that executable from blob storage and it will copy it onto each of the compute nodes within the batch service pool that we've got available. It will also take from data factory a series of reference data sets and link services and things that we've said within our data factory configuration this is what you need to support the execution of the console app. So a good example is quite simply where the raw data is that we need to clean, what service that's running on, what the file name is. So we can pass that information in at runtime. Then at the point of execution, the batch service that executable is going to run on its virtual machines, that CSV file is going to be downloaded from the data lake store in this case. It's going to be copied to the, the virtual machine. That execution is going to run and then the batch service is going to upload the data back to the data lake store. So we then get our clean data. A bit of hard work and I'm afraid it's not over yet. So the other thing we need to consider is authentication here with Azure AD. So we're going to have to authenticate against our data lake store. It's not something that Data Factory can do for us if we want this custom activity. And we're also going to have to need to use Key Vault to do this. As of September last year, the credentials that Data Factory passed to the batch service in free text, it doesn't do that anymore. We have to get those compute pool VMs to go and get their own credentials to authenticate. Then assuming uh, everything completes and it's all good, what the batch service will do is it will write back our standard out and standard error log files to that blob storage. So that's kind of, I guess, completes the picture. And, and one last thing to touch on is that those VMs within that batch compute pool can also have VNet access. Again, considerations for infrastructure and express routes. Now, you might think, Paul, you've gone off on a right tangent there. You know, what is all this about? What's this picture on my screen? Well, again, you know, if we're going to make a comparison between Data Factory and SSIS, we could say that within SSIS, we've already been doing all of this. You know, we will quite happily drag on a script task in SSIS in our control flow. You know, we will merrily edit that C Sharp or VB or whatever, and it gives us that sort of virtual Visual Studio environments with all the classes and bits and bobs that we need and we will sort of code away there and change our data as we see fit. Then in SSIS, you know, we close it, we, we run it and it's all kind of taken care of for us and that C sharp gets compiled, the binary gets inlined in our um, DTSX files and, and SQL Server, you know, goes off and runs it for us. This is the same thing. It's just when it's not all nicely wrapped up in our SQL Server product, when we're working within this Azure environment, we obviously need to do some of the plumbing and the hard work ourselves. You know, we've got to do all that connection between services and we've got to handle that authentication ourselves. So, so again, loose comparison. We've been doing it with script tasks and SIS. This is the equivalent. Moving on, other ways to extend our data factory. So we can call REST APIs. Everything's got a REST API now, apart from my wife, but you know, say la vie. We can, of course, hit those REST APIs with our data factory web activity and, and do our usual sort of post and things. I sort of crossed out your functions here because once upon a time, if we wanted to hit functions, we would use a web activity. Now functions, if you spotted it on that link services, screen is now supported as a first class citizen so all good um third one of course is our ssis packages again you know I've, I've kind of we've made lots of comparisons between ssis and data factory but i guess now's the time to realize that if we want to run ssis packages in azure you know maybe we've we've put a lot of hard work into our sys packages on prem and we need to lift and shift them up here, then fine, you know, we, we can do that and we can use Data Factory to execute them for us. Now, just sort of thinking about our integration runtimes, and I said I'd come back to them. With our custom activities, we talked about the batch service and how it has this compute pool of virtual machines. The SSIS integration runtime is, is very much the, the same sort of animal. 
it does have a cluster of virtual machines and it does have that compute pool sat under there. So if that compute pool of VMs is going to execute our SSIS packages with this sort of data factory veneer, you know, then what else could we do there? Well, coming back to my hosted integration runtime scenario, where I said, you know, if you've got on-prem data you want to get up into Azure, you know, you can use those gateways. What you might also consider is using SSIS packages to do the same thing. Why? Well, the SSIS packages with that um, integration runtime, with that cluster of compute, as I've said, they can have VNet access, and if we've got express routes, that might be preferable over the hosted IR. But what's also kind of a, a good situation here is that with our hosted IR, we do only have four compute nodes to scale out to if we want that sort of load balancing high availability. With our SIS IR, we do have 10 nodes that we can scale out to, and we can potentially have eight packages executed per node. So I'm sort of suggesting something which, again, might seem a little bit convoluted. And what I'm saying is that use an SSIS package to copy data from your on-premises SQL server up into blob storage. You know, and if you've got 80 tables that you need to copy up there, get 80 SSIS packages, get them to scale out on the SSIS IR, you know, wrap it all up and parallelize it using Data Factory. And they say it kind of gives you that sort of cloud scale out capability that obviously isn't necessarily as, as quite as natural if we're, we're still on-prem. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, yeah, we can save questions for the end. So just sticking lastly, I think, with our SSIS packages, because uh, I appreciate there are, say, there, there's probably uh, lots of good developer investment gone into sys packages over the years. So if we actually want to schedule our SSIS packages up there now in Azure, what do we actually need to do that? How do we just do that lift and shift? Well. The first thing we need, of course, is our Azure Data Factory. We do need some sort of SQL instance. Now, this can be a, an Azure managed instance, or it can just be a logical instance. We are going to need that SSIS IR with its compute pool or you know that cluster of VMs. And at the point of deploying that IR, we will get our familiar SSIS DB. So Again, we're working in Azure, there's going to be a bit more engineering, a bit more plumbing, a bit more grunt work that we're going to have to do to actually get this stuff connected and up and running than if we were just using SQL Server. So I mentioned scheduling, three options, of course, number one, via a data factory pipeline and the SSIS package execution activity. We can use our SQL agent, but of course, with the, the fairly big caveat that that does need a managed instance to do that. And then thirdly, we have this um, thing called a DTU job, which um, I, I, I definitely try and avoid now. It's kind of a, an old thing that came along with our SQL DBs, but we can use a DTU job with a, a bit of T-SQL to create an execution of a package in our SSIS DB directly if we wanted to. So three options for scheduling. All three, of course, have wall clocks and, and our usual sort of recursive patterns of doing things. And I guess the, the only other thing to note is that our ADF pipelines, of course, do have the kind of event-driven more logic app sort of capability too. So I think that kind of covers off my, my sort of first section of, of the talk on control flows. Let's now kind of get into the fun stuff, shall we? Data factory in production. So what do we need to know? A couple of slides. Uh, hopefully uh, I'm not going to labor these too much, but Data Factory now in V2 gives us this development environment which is browser based. So we cannot develop Data Factory on an airplane, which makes me very sad. Within the browser based environment, we've kind of got a couple of things that we need to be aware of. It does have source control integration to Git and, and GitHub. And 
we can create code branches directly from this data factory UI. So, you know, it's kind of interacting with our source control in a way that is slightly different to what we might be used to doing in, in Visual Studio, for example. When we hit save, it is going to do a commit to our repo every single time. So every time you hit save on something that is dirty in the browser panels, it's doing a commit behind the scenes. So it does mean that if you've got somebody else that is using the same repo with something more traditional like Visual Studio, they're probably going to get quite a lot of noise when they're doing their sort of um, pushes and pulls and things. So just bear that in mind. When we actually do a publish, it is going to take all of that JSON, all of that content from our debug environment and it is going to push it to the data factory service that we've got deployed which obviously again it, it seems a little not perhaps quite with convention that we've kind of got all these tools just as, as options on the toolbar normally we we want more of a, a formal deployment process a couple of other things you know key validation and, and discarding dirty changes and then we can get a full arm template extract if we want so, you know, why am I telling you all these things? Well, within this browser-based environment, and if we do want to think about continuous integration and continuous delivery, I guess that the question is, how do we do that? And option one, given what we've perhaps talked about there, is that because Data Factory has this portal UI, this developer interface that has direct connections to our source code repo, We've got that master branch, and yeah, we can create other developer branches, but really what we've got here is only, if we've got a single data factory service, we've simply got a development environment and a production environment. So one service, but potentially two environments based on how we're using it. And we do you know, get some quite nice collaboration of, of um, code and things when we've got multiple people working on it, but whoever then merges their code back to that master branch and then hits publish, that's potentially going to override our, our production service. So, you know, obviously option one is, is certainly not ideal. I, I certainly wouldn't be comfortable developing in that data factory UI if I knew that clicking publish meant that I was hitting the prod service directly. So again, not ideal, but it's something um, worth being aware of. Number two, I think perhaps is more sort of the favorable route here. And if we've got the sort of the same sort of setup with our debug, our, our development service, what we're probably then going to do is take that ARM template and we're going to push that through, you know, sort of separate isolated environments. And that's really what we're going to want to do and have that test data factory service in there as that sort of middle layer. So I don't claim to be a DevOps expert, but it's obviously just worth being aware of because of this developer environment and, and that interaction with source code. And, you know, this is kind of a, an emerging trend, I think. Uh, there's a similar sort of thing happening now with, with Databricks and how it interacts directly with our source code and how we save it and do those commits. It's, it's obviously something that's best practices are, are still yet to be defined here, I think. But... Be aware of it because it's not Visual Studio is, I guess, the takeaway. Last thing just to talk about, cost. It's generally a question I always get asked when I do a talk, how much does Data Factory cost? And the, the answer, uh, consultant's answer is it depends. But what I've tried to do is um, give you sort of a, a bit more of an informed answer. Um, and what I've said here is that in this very sort of niche scenario, if we're copying one file every day to Azure, from on-premises for one year using that hosted IR gateway and it takes less than an hour of compute to do it, I am going to say that the estimated cost is £40 for the year. Now that's obviously a say very niche. Nobody has one file and nobody has a file that is you know that small. You know files are going to take longer and we're going to have very complex pipelines. Um, so I say it's data factory costing is, is a little bit finger in the air. There is lots of variables and things to consider. And what makes it even worse is that data factory, as I've said, it is the, the orchestrator of our wider solution. So what isn't taken into account here is our SSIS integration runtime and its virtual machines. You know, they're all charged separately. 
if we have Databricks and we have a cluster that's sat behind there and we've got those Databricks units to consider. So although it might be £40 in this very niche scenario for Data Factory, as soon as we start invoking other services, we've got those costs of those services that we're calling to consider as well. So doing any sort of cost calculation on a, an entire modern data warehouse solution, I, I, uh, you know, I'd probably be spending a long time in a spreadsheet, I think is, uh, is what I'd say. But hopefully I say it's a bit of an informed answer. OK, enough of all that stuff. Let's talk about data flows. I'm sure you're all excited to know what data flows is about. And again, we're making some comparisons here between SSIS and what we had in there for our data flows. So I always kind of frame this as data factory meets data bricks and they fall in love. Ah, oh, no. OK, so data factory at the moment, if we think about our current control flow type scenario, we can call Databricks notebooks and, and jar files if we've got our compiled Scala, and we can call Python scripts as well. So that's as an activity, and I'll show you this uh, hopefully in a moment. So Data Factory there is just running that activity for us. What we can actually now do is, or what's kind of coming soon, is this idea of a data flow. Now, the reason I say um, Data Factory loves Databricks is because those data flows are actually using Databricks under the hood. Exciting, right? It's very surreal on a webinar. No one's excited. It's just me sat here on my own. Anyway, so the reason for the excitement is quite simply that now, instead of Data Factory having an activity that it has to go and call, What's happening behind the scenes is that that JSON from our data factory, it's being taken and the Scala that we might need for Databricks is being written for us. And that Scala is passed to Databricks in a compiled form as a JAR file and Databricks goes and runs it. So this, you know, we, there's a bit of a conflict here because ultimately this is some proprietary stuff that Microsoft have created. Uh, I've called it here the Microsoft secret source. And there is obviously some abstraction here. And, and there's very much that argument of, you know, with abstraction, does that come misunderstanding? Or, you know, what's the sort of thinking? I think I, I'm still very much divided. Now, one thing that I can relate to is the fact that I've very much been living in a Microsoft world for, for quite a long time now. I'm certainly not a Spark expert. So actually, having Data Factory there with its UI and with that sort of layers and layers of abstraction now, which means I've kind of got that power of that Spark ecosystem, now in a sort of friendly drag and drop Data Factory UI, it's quite nice. I am mindful of the dangers, but I think it's quite nice at this point. Mark says he's excited, so that's good. A little bit of self-promotion again. The Microsoft Ignite tour that's in London in a few weeks' time, I'll be there doing a one-hour session just on data flow. So again, there's obviously lots more scope for going deeper here. And then just coming back to this one before we have a look at the demo, in this scenario where I said, why use Data Factory? And we had it there at the bottom as our management and orchestration. You know, well, maybe let's go one further and actually say that that Data Factory could potentially replace our Databricks components as well, maybe, who knows. So without further ado, let's have a look at it. What I've got is a very simple scenario, you know, let's not go too complicated here. And hopefully we all recognize this, this is T-SQL. I've not written any for a very long time, but um, we all hopefully understand that within my AdventureWorks database, our go-to database, I've done a very simple select statement that is doing an aggregate, an account of the sales order lines that we have against our sales order header. All good. Hopefully we, we all kind of understand that, a fairly good baseline. Now, what if I want to do the same thing, but I want to do it in Databricks? That's going to require some Scala or some Python or, or whatever. I say, oh, my cluster stopped. Fail. I don't claim to be a... Scala developer, but you know I, I can I can Google my way through this one, and we can achieve the same sort of thing in my Databricks notebook with a bit of Scala. Yes, there is a password in there, but who cares? 
and we can get those tables and we can do that query and we can write that back to the database if we want. And we can do that, you know, it's, it's fairly a simple scenario, but it is going to require some Scala to write it. Obviously, you know, we, we kind of know where this is going. So instead of writing that T-SQL or instead of writing that Scala, let's use Dataflow to do it. So what I've got here in my data factory is I've got a pipeline, which at the moment is empty. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, let's have a new data flow. And I'm going to create it and I'm going to very generously call this AdventureWorks Analysis, barely. So this is data flow. And what we can do is we can say, okay, give me a source. And let's say this is our order header. And what I've done is I've pre-created the data sets in Data Factory that I'm going to need to do this. I can edit and I can go new if I want. Um, actually, a confession, the reason I'm using a, a SQL database here is that I can very quickly infer the schema of the data set, which does very nicely pick up the data types as well. So I've kind of cheated there because I don't want to have to tell data factory what it is and these data types do become quite important when we're using these data sets within a data flow so anyway order header defined and then let's have my order details and um, what am I doing import schema did I import the schema on the header no I didn't good and now let's have a look at our tr transformations. So we can see that we've kind of got this very nice growing list of stuff that we can do. So first thing we can do is let's have a, a join from my order header to my order details. And let's join on the sales order ID. You know, very similar to my T-SQL. Here's my crib sheet in code. And then let's now do an aggregation. So let's, very much like I had, let's group on, let's say, sales order number, and I want to aggregate by, and I'm just going to, I forgot what I called it, order line detail. And then what we get within our data flow is this expression builder. Again, SSIS-esque, if you like, similar idea. So within my expression builder, I can say, count and from my inputs which is going to be my sales order detail ID nothing complicated and then let's have that going to a sync or a destination and that sync is going to be my AdventureWorks table which I've called order count table and we can sort out the mappings if we've got differences between my attribute names here and, and what's in my table, so that's all good. So that's, that's my very simple data flow created in line with that T-SQL. Now, what happens next? Well, if my Databricks cluster has started, or oh, it hasn't, should have started it sooner, rookie error. We'll give it a few minutes. Um, what I guess I can show you is, and what we can talk about is that that um, Databricks cluster, we've got, kind of got this option here in our data flows called debug mode. So very similar to what we have at the control flow level, but we can actually do things now where we actually get Databricks to look at our data and, and to infer things. Um, just be mindful at the moment, if you are using this, that you will need the Databricks runtime version 5. At the moment, it doesn't support anything higher. So, of course, that's what my four data flow cluster is. Um, it's going to try and talk to that cluster, which is starting. If you're doing this for the first time, though, what it's going to do is, if you look at your cluster, it's going to go away and install a whole bunch of libraries and things on it to support that data flow execution. So, of course, this is already done. My cluster has mercifully started, which is all good. Um, so I've got my data flow. I'll just do a quick validation. 
Um, what it means with that debug mode on, if we want to actually now look at my sales order header, and you might notice we've got data preview, what we can do is we can hit that, and this is where it's actually going to get Databricks to do some work to inspect that. And we know Databricks does lazy reads of things. This is where it's actually using the cluster to, to hit that data set and return the information for you. So, you know, it's kind of quite nice if we want to look at this data as we go through and as, as we build that up. So anyway, that's my very simple data flow. So what I can then do is I can come back to my sort of control flow level and it knows which data flow I want to use. And now I can just link it to my Databricks service, which is, again, it's a link service defined in Data Factory that points at that cluster. We don't need any staging information here. That's very much if we're writing to our SQL DW and we want to put CSVs and things in our storage account before we polybase them into our SQL DW. So don't need that. That's all good. So what I'm going to do is just save that. And what I'm going to do is now hit debug. Now, this service is still in preview, as you probably know. And having played with this on and off, unfortunately for me at the moment, this takes far too long. So I'll, I'll hit run. And Data Factory has now obviously got to do that work to compile that Scala and pass it off to Databricks. And it's got to run it. Now, this is why we're deliberately take, talking about a very simple query and thing that we're doing. Because if I truncate table and insert in T-SQL, you know, we're, we're talking less than a second here for, for this fairly small data set. If we're doing the equivalent thing with my Scala that I had, using JDBC drivers and, and my Pigeon Scala, if I'm actually writing to a separate table, just so it's not going to tread on anyone's toes here, if I run all of my cells, I think this sort of comes back in sort of like circa 16 seconds or so. Yeah, it doesn't take a long time. So fairly fast. Yeah, 15.9 minus the setup and things. And that's written to my table, which I've just called Scala on the, the end. So that's done with the Scala. Meanwhile, oh, <laughs> meanwhile, I was going to say my, my data flow is still running, but apparently not. It's returned. So, you know, maybe I, I stand corrected here. And it's basically done the equivalent, which we know there's no surprises. But, you know, if I don't want to write the Scala and I don't want to write the T-SQL, and I want to get that equivalent information in here, we can now use Dataflow, and it's obviously very nice. I kept it simple, I say quite deliberately, because I, I thought I was going to have timing issues, but uh, apparently not. This Data Factory, it's got a couple of other example data flows in it, um, which come as part of the um, sort of Microsoft build. So this is, is quite nice just to see what else is capable, the art of the possible. The taxi one, you know, it's kind of got a few more things in here with joins and, and aggregates. You, you know, you kind of get the idea. And But ultimately, you know, if we are thinking about what we had available in SSIS, you know, we're getting now a, a kind of an equivalent list. And obviously, as this service matures and, you know, that interaction between Databricks and, and Data Factory becomes better, um, you know, we can see that we could easily, or, or somebody could fairly easily refactor an SSIS package using Dataflow, and then suddenly, you know, they've got the scale-out capabilities and compute of, of Spark underneath, rather than using that SSIS integration runtime. Okay, enough said. Hope you, hopefully you like it. Um, the, the question, which I'm probably sure is on all of your lips, is when is this going to be available? I did email um, Mark Chroma, the, the PM at Microsoft, um, just before this webinar to ask that very question. Um, he didn't tell me whether I could share this information or not, um, but I think ultimately uh, I'll be conservative and, and say that we're sort of looking at public preview sort of the middle of this year, I think. Don't quote me. It's, it's kind of what, uh, what I was uh, told. So that's it, I think, for me. 
all I've got left is a thank you for listening slide and a couple of links, a couple of plugs, and please bear in mind that uh, a PDF of those slides is already, already in my GitHub repo. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Paul. So if anyone else has got any questions, can you um, put them in the window and we'll get them asked? Uh, I have got some questions for you, so hopefully I'm not going to be talking nonsense and, and there was, these will make sense. So I was hoping you could elaborate a little bit on the blob file event triggers. I, my understanding is you can put a watch on not just specific files, but you can put a watch on a directory as well. Is that, is that correct? I think so, yeah. I'm, I'm just going to have a, a quick look, I guess. It's, um, say, so last time I looked, it was a, a file, but let's just go in here and create a trigger, shall we? Events, blob storage, path ends in, blob created, blob, blob deleted, which uh, currently seems to be mandatory. So, yeah. So, I guess we could say that blob path begins, blob path ends. So I guess it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's looking for whatever's at the end, isn't it? Whether it be a file or whether it be a, a container. Yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, I, I mean, I was actually thinking it'd be quite nice to have some kind of regex pattern there. I mean, it doesn't look like it oh, yeah. does that right now, but uh, that would be quite Tell me useful. about it. <laughs> okay. So I was a little bit confused about the Azure integration run times. So could you give a few examples of why you might implement multiple Azure integration runtimes. I think you might have given a scenario for load balancing. Would there be any other reasons? A scenario for for Azure specific integration runtime. Yeah, because I think you said you could you, you rather than just running one. I think you said you could run several at the same time. Yeah, it's it's, it's confusing quite simply because they're all called the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, the the sort of load balancing I was talking about was specific to the self-hosted integration right. runtime. So where we've got gateways and things with, um, you know, on-prem servers and those gateway clients can sit there and, and if Data Factory has got multiple activities to execute, it's got multiple IRs, it will use all of them or try to. That's the, that's the self-hosted one. Okay, all right. When we talked about load balancing. Yeah. The, the Azure one, um, the, the scenario really there for having multiples is that sort of region handling. If you don't want your data to move out of a particular region, tell the copy activity to use the integration runtime that is only for that region. Right, okay. Okay, that, that makes sense. So talking about the sys integration runtimes, so presume you, you did say there was a, an Azure sys integration runtime so you can basically host the sys packages um in azure and data factory will orchestrate those the, the yep. and shift scenario but i don't know if i've misunderstood that this but you can run on premise and I th don't you need sys integration runtime installed on your on-premise environment as well or do you just use your native sys and runtime the the integration runtime for sys packages that that you've got from data factory is as far as i'm aware is it does only allow you to create it in azure oh right you okay can't, you can't you can't say to it you know it it's it's going to use something elsewhere so yeah it's it's it, data factory kind of puts a, a veneer over that cluster of virtual machines and calls it the ssis integration runtime yeah, because I was I was wondering. I mean, I don't know about used cases for this, but I was wondering it would be whether it would be quite nice for ADF to be able to orchestrate on-premise sys packages as well, especially if they were shoving stuff up into Blob Store somewhere. Yeah, I mean, you could do that with the the hosted integration runtime and just use you know, the you, uh, SQL agent or something. Yeah, you know, just um, have a have a store procedure or something and, and tell data factory to to trigger the store procedure oh, and right, okay point it at your oh that's, yeah, so that's yeah. one option awesome awesome are there any limitations between adf and spark integrations there's certain things that you can't do that you <laughs> yeah there's, there's, there's bound to be limitations <laughs> yeah. i'm sure uh, you know the the capabilities you're going to get out of the box with um with Spark and things, you know, is, is far going to outweigh natively what Data Factory gives you. I mean, the the list of data flows, obviously, there. It's you know, it's reasonably comprehensive, but yeah. you know, there's going to be you know, geospatial data and things you might want to bring in, and 
you know, if you've got your own models that you've trained and you want to work with them and things like that, you know, you, you're never going to get away from needing to do the complex stuff um, directly in Databricks, I think. Okay, cool. So we've got a question from Andy Stahl. He says, I'm new to Azure and will need to migrate our existing ETL, which utilizes SIS into Azure. What books, online resources, etc., do you recommend I start with for learning ADF? Good question. I'm presuming your blog is going to be a good starting point. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was going to plug my blog, but uh, um, it's, I think it's a hard one, Andy, because, uh, I mean, certainly I've found that, you know, some of this stuff, is, as soon as a book is written, it becomes out of date. So it feels like um, for the, the nitty-gritty of how to do it, there probably isn't any books out there. For the, the high-level concepts and things, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a hard one. These, I, I think I, um, I think Pluralsight are looking at uh, doing some courses on Data Factory soon. Okay. There is some posts on my blog, particularly um, I think I, I wrote one recently about stopping and starting that Sys integration runtime using um, Data Factory and um, using some Azure automation in there because ultimately once you start that uh, Sys integration runtime, it's a cluster of VMs that are sat there costing you money. So having them stop and start with your pipeline is obviously advantageous. So there's, I've definitely got a blog post out there to do that. Yeah, it's, it's hard to get a general guide. Uh, so it's, it's the, this, this intro slide deck I came up with, I, I, I did uh, torment over what to put into it, and it, hopefully it was a good enough overview. I mean, I guess giving yourself a, a, a task as well. So uh, let's just say you want to import a CSV uh, somewhere into Azure and then you want to orchestrate that somewhere. I suppose having a dedicated thing that you want to do and then just trying to fudge your way through ADF. I mean, would would that be doable, would it, to fudge something like that? Yeah, certainly. Anything? And and I think what you'll probably get in Data Factory is that the, there used to be some wizards, and, and I say there is a couple of sort of how-to videos in here, or, or the, the, you know, there used to be. I think if we do create pipeline, oh no, it doesn't give us a wizard. There used to be a, a copy data. There we go. There is a copy data wizard in here. You know, so if you want to, like Mark says, get from CSV to, to somewhere, this wizard will kind of walk you through it. Um, just be mindful, though, of what the wizard has created in terms of components in your data factory. Obviously, you know, there's lots of ways to make it a lot more dynamic and complex, but this is probably a good place to start. Yeah, and I do know there's a couple of videos recorded at the last Ignite um, on Data Factory. I think they're they're not really low level, but they're they're probably good enough to get going on Data Factory as well. Yeah. So they might be worth checking out. Cool. All right. Yeah. So, like, how do you scale up a pipeline? And I'm presuming that a pipeline is the smallest unit of scale is it or or it does it auto scale um yeah good question i guess the the main thing that i would do within the data factory pipeline at the control flow level if i wanted to scale out the the operations um is with the for each activity right which um eludes me so the for each activity it's not by default a, a recursive thing what it will do by default is actually create 20 parallel executions of whatever is happening within it. So you could say it is doing for each, but in parallel. Um, so, but yeah, by default, it'll do 20. I think the, the maximum batch count now is up to about 50 executions. Yeah. So I say it's, it's quite a nice way just to scale out without actually doing anything extra. Cool. Right, and final question. Uh, I don't think we've got anything else coming up. So final question. I mean, have you got any tips for debugging pipelines at all? I mean, I find Sys very difficult to develop in and debug, but at least there are some things you can do. Yeah, I guess my, my only recommendation is just the, the little debug icon um, that, yeah. that's up there on the toolbar. Yeah. If you run that um, and then have a look at the outputs, and you know, it does give you the, the, the exact JSON inputs and outputs of each activity that's happened and cool. what errors and, and why. And you know, it's, it's quite a nice steer when you are debugging. Excellent, excellent. You can also um, set breakpoints on, on oh. your activities as well. So you see the little red dots there. I've got, you know, if I'm going to drag other stuff on here, I could say, you know, set um, set the breakpoint at my first activity, and as you can see, it grays out the the second. So cool, kind of useful. 
Yeah, excellent, excellent. All right, well, I think that wraps everything up. So I just want to thank you very much for giving this session. I'm noticing a massive um, industry desire for, well, at least looking into ADF. I don't know if that's your experience, but um, it, it's certainly going to be becoming useful to me. Yeah, um, I mean, I say in terms of orchestration and, and scheduling of, of our BI type data stuff in Azure, it's, it's pretty much the main service that you're going to use to do it. So absolutely. Well, thank you very much for joining us, and um, I hope we get you back on again, Paul, to maybe show us something else cool in ADF.